right. So as I said, our message today is a second part of a study that we began on the Sabbath. Um, and it's, it's titled uh, um, Happiness... Happiness is circumstantial, joy is not. In the, on the Sabbath, we, we covered the, the, some of the steps that uh, we can take um, for a, a life of continuous supernatural joy. And one of the concepts we talked about was immersing ourselves in the teachings of the Bible. In the scriptures, many times joy is associated with a mature knowledge of God's word. David said in Psalm 19.8, he said, the precepts of Yehovah are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yehovah is pure, enlightening the eyes. And this is, this is not atypical for scripture. And we just heard, read in Proverbs, essentially these same concepts, right? The law of God and the 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 precepts and and um, principles of God lead to happiness and that's why it says over and over that happy is he who does these things but you know we have difficulty seeing things correctly even with our eyes, right? When we see it for ourselves, until we know the statutes of our Father in heaven. In Psalm 119, verse 14, it says, In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. Now, these are the words of King David, who was a man after God's own heart, the apple of his eye. And as we've talked about before, you know, David was a man of many sins, did a lot of terrible things, yet he repented uh, honestly, sincerely. And so that is why um, he was so dear to our Heavenly Father. And, you know, here David compares... Uh, delighting in the law of God um, as much as delighting in all of his riches. And he had significant riches. So, you know, you read over in John 15, turn over there, chapter 15 of the book of John, verses 10 through 11. It says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Those things I have spoken to you that you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So these verses teach us that joy is to be found in a knowledge of God's character of his commandments, and that these are to be found in his word, right? So there is a definite link between true joy and a knowledge and understanding of God and his ways. So if we're not having regular Bible study, if we're not looking at scripture on a daily basis, then we're really missing out on a full measure of that joy, 
right? These verses teach us that joy is found in the knowledge of God's character and commandments, and that these can only be found in his word. And if you haven't really experienced much of that joy, perhaps you might benefit, all of us would benefit from spending a little more time with our Heavenly Father, understanding His Word, studying His Word, and spending time with Him in prayer. Because there is a, a level of peace and happiness and joy that comes through that. So what place should the Bible have in our lives? And it's that place is uh, really illustrated by an interesting Old Testament custom, right? These pious Jews wore these little boxes um, called frontlets on their foreheads, and um, they contain bits and, and passages of Scripture. And even though they memorize the Scripture, these frontlets, as they're called, were warned to remind them that God's word was always to be the object of their deepest meditations and a source of the principles by which they ordered their lives. The command to wear frontlets occurs three times in the Old Testament, and in each case, the practice related to one of the fundamental doctrines of Scripture. And I, I'm not saying that we need to start wearing these frontlets um, on our forehead. But this is what they did traditionally, because this concept of keeping the law of God as frontlets before your eyes is, in my mind, a more spiritual concept, right? We, we read the law, the, the whole law, is read and studied in the seventh year at the Feast of Tabernacles. We post the law on our gateposts and our door frames. We teach them to our children when we rise up and when they go to bed. And that serves, and it says that we do these things to keep it in the forefront of our mind. Right? So it's you keep them as frontlets before your mind because it's ingrained in your head. And so the first mention of these frontlets is in Exodus 13. And Exodus 13 contains a summary of the events that took place in Egypt at the first Passover, which illustrates the way God would later pass over those whose sins were covered by the death of Jesus Christ and deliver them from the penalty of death. After a summation of these events, it says in verse 9, it shall be a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's, that um, the law is to be in your mouth. Yehovah's law is to be in your mouth for with a strong hand, Yehovah has brought you out of Egypt. So the first doctrine that they were to have before their eyes was of the atonement of salvation through the shedding of blood. Now the second time the frontlets are mentioned is in Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you turn there, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 8. It says, Hear, O Israel, Yehovah your Elohim, Yehovah is one. And that's pretty simple and straightforward. Yehovah is one. He's not one of three. He's not three melded into one in some way. He's one. There is only one true God, not many. Christ is not equal with our Father in heaven. He's definitely above us and second in command over the entire universe and deserves 
our adoration and respect and obedience for what he's done for us, but he is not God the Father. He is one. Verse 5, you shall love Yehovah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk to them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And so this is essentially a summary of the character and requirements of God. And the second great commandment is the nature of God and our responsibility to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. Right? And these are concepts, this binding them as a sign on your hand and as frontlets between your eyes. When everything we do, right, Binding it as a sign on your hand is, is in your actions. So everything that you do is for the glory of God. And when we think about things and when we meditate in our mind, our thought process, right? What did Paul say? Be transformed through the renewing of your mind. Right? So your mind controls your actions, so they're inextricably linked. Let's turn over to Deuteronomy 11, and we'll see the third place that this is mentioned. Deuteronomy 11, 18. It says, You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. See, this is, this is not commanded to literally do that, those things. It's as a sign. And as I said, our actions is what this is representing. God is really setting forth a principle by which he will bless the life of any individual or nation and the principle of his obedience, right, is that if, if you obey and do the things he said to do, you will receive blessing. And where there is no obedience, he will send judgment. You see, and we constantly go through the cycles in human history where there is tremendous suffering. War, pestilence, famine, because of our continued disobedience. So this judgment will come if we don't obey. Let's look at Deuteronomy 11, 19 through 21. Again, he says, You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, and when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that Yehovah swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. Right? So we put the law of God up there as a constant reminder. I have the Ten Commandments posted on the entryway in my house. Every time I walk through the front door, I see it. I have it up in the hallway at the top of the stairs. Every time I go up the stairs, I see it. So we have to constantly be reminded so that we don't forget. We, I've, I've given a sermon in the past talking about 
the fact that it only takes two generations for something to be completely erased and forgotten, including people. So, you know, it doesn't take very long. And that's why God has this, this principle of repetition. We keep the feasts every year. We keep the Sabbath every week. We read the law every seventh year so that we don't forget. And that's important. And obedience is to characterize our lives as God's people, right? That's one of the characteristics of the people of God is their obedience to him and his laws. And that's not a new concept. Right? We, we, we've known this now for people that are new to the faith. They might not have a full understanding of what that is. And even for us, right, we have to emphasize it because God emphasizes it throughout Scripture. And in this life, none of us, not me, not you, will ever master all of the great truths of God to be found in Scripture. The Word of God is inexhaustible, like God himself. And if our joy depended on a mastery of God's ways, we would never actually experience it, would we? Because... His ways are so far above ours and his mind so much greater than ours that we can never understand it completely. But instead, our joy depends on our relationship to God and our life with him and our relationship to others, right? That's why you have the two great commandments. One is about our, the first great commandment is about our relationship with our heavenly father. The second great commandment commandment is our relationship to our fellow man. Right? So if we're living to the best of our ability, his way of life, we will have that joy. However, if if there is to Be the the joy in the quote-unquote Christian life that there should be, then there must be a deep and growing experience of the basic truth upon which that life is founded, which means we have to grow an understanding about the laws and the principles and the statutes of our Father in heaven. It means that we should take these basic truths and apply them in our lives every single day, right? What did the apostle James say? He said, it's not the hearers of the word that are justified. It's the doers you have to apply. And that's why apply them as frontlets in your forehead before your eyes so with your mind, you serve God, and in your hand. So with your actions, you serve God. And that's what that whole thing means. We can hear, and we can like what we hear, and we can say, oh, that's really, you know, a nice passage of Scripture. But if we don't apply it in our lives, then it's completely useless. Right? It's like bouncing off your forehead. It's not penetrating. You're not being transformed through the renewing of your mind. And we must understand the nature of the atonement made for us by Christ. We need to strive to know God better and to love him through action. You see, love is not an emotion. Right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love is an action. And we have to live that action. 
And we have to live obediently before him as his children, or at least make every attempt to do so that we can. So we must understand the nature of the atonement made for us by Christ. And we really must strive to know God better and to love him. And there is a great deal of unrest on this earth because the world does not obey their creator. They don't do what God said. They don't live his way, the way that we're trying to live. And there will always be unrest for those who do not submit to God and know our elder brother, the Messiah, and our high priest, Jesus the Christ. And apart from him, there is no true peace, no joy, and no real happiness. It can't be found. Now, people, you know, they might get a new gadget or win the lottery or whatever, and they think they are happy for that particular moment, right? They go experience uh, an event or like a football game or whatever, and they think they are happy, right? Until, of course, their team loses or one of their favorite players doesn't play as well as they wanted them to, right? That happiness is superficial and this should never be the case with us right if we are keeping the covenant of our creator that should bring us closer to god and we should we should feed on scripture as paul says over in romans 15 what does he say he says may the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. So if we are right with our Father in heaven, then he is going to fill us with that joy and that peace because we don't have fear. Right? We have 100% confidence in the promises of God. So we know what our spectacular and joyous future is going to be. Right, it's a little bit rough right now, but we know this is temporary. And we're not going to be given any trial that we can't endure. So we know we can endure and get through anything coming our way already, because that's what he told us. And we really need to have the indwelling of that Holy Spirit to experience the fullness of that joy, that continuing and ongoing joy that is always with us. And it often seems to the world that, you know, we, that we have a religion that makes us miserable. Right? You may have heard people um, that are in the world complaining about such things, and it's understandable because we do have all kinds of problems, right? We have our aches and pains. We're miserable and sometimes, in a sense, um, uh, because we're in pain or whatever, but we rise above that. Sometimes you have to rise above the way you feel and perform the duty at hand. And when you don't feel like, you know, getting up and continuing, you have to push on. No matter how we feel, 
we have to push forward and continue to be the type of son or daughter that Christ would have us be to our Father in heaven. And that's why it's important to not forsake the assembling together because this attitude or this uh, way of thinking is contagious, right? And, and so when you get together with people of like minds, it's very encouraging to know that you're not alone because sometimes in this world, when you're living God's way, you feel like a complete stranger everywhere you go. Rarely ever in a room of people do I ever think I'm of like minds with those people. I may have friends that I'm close to and that we share a lot of commonality in the way we think, but there's always that huge dividing line. And so it's easy to feel like you're alone. Right? The world looks at us as if we're, we have these, these, ongoing sufferings. What do you mean you you can't go out on on Friday night? What do you mean you can't do what you want on the Sabbath? You know, these types of things. Um, so we can't really expect people that don't understand to... Uh, to look at us and think that that's what they want, right? They, they, don't, they don't think that way because it requires self-sacrifice, and most people don't want to do that. And, and they don't want to seek very earnestly for anything that they look at and think, well, that seems kind of not that great because of the self-sacrifice. And, and this is why God must call a person to this truth and open their minds through the Holy Spirit, right? A mind that sees Christianity as uncomfortable or even painful as we suffer through um, different trials sees that it's uh, entirely worth it, right? We see that no matter what trial or tribulation comes, it's going to be worth it because we understand the plan of salvation that our Father has for us. And these, these people often are, you know, very miserable. And they, as miserable people, have little to offer a world that is desperately and often hopelessly searching for happiness. Look around at all of the suffering. And most of that suffering is caused by man's mistreatment of his fellow man. The oppression, the theft, it's, it's just the violence. It's just terrible how we treat each other. And of course, as Christians, we, we do suffer. Even though through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we may sense that true happiness is our birthright as members of the family of God, right? We suffer in spite of knowing that. And even though we sense that and we know that, we still have moments where we're just somewhat miserable, where, you know, um, from whatever trial we're going through, whether it be physical or spiritual. And to such a world... And to all unhappy people, the opening words of the Sermon on the Mount give hope because Jesus began his first great sermon with the promise of the joy of heaven. If you look at Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 3 through 12. 
It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In fact, this is what we should read and look at whenever we feel miserable. Whenever we think, well, that joy isn't there. God didn't fulfill his promise because I'm not, I'm not happy. Well, there are times when you're not going to be quote-unquote happy, but that joy can still be there. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. See, we're blessed for all of these things that seem to be terrible, right? It said, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So if you think about it, if a worldly person reads that first half of the first phrase of every one of these verses, he's going to say, I'm not so sure I really want that. But we have the promise that follows. In this sermon, the word blessed means joy or joyful. Not in the worldly sense, of course, because the happiness of the world is a superficial happiness that depends on circumstances. You see, most of the world is running around looking for some external source of happiness. And it doesn't exist. They're miserable with themselves. And they are looking for something to make that better. But it doesn't happen. And that's why that internal focus, that of self-examination and continually, what did Paul say? I beat myself daily into subjection. Right? So we have to constantly discipline ourselves and overcome. And this joy will grow and grow. Right? So this word joy, or blessed, I'm sorry, means joy or joyful. The joy spoken of in Matthew 5 doesn't depend on circumstances and fills the soul with joy even during the most depressing events, like the death of a loved one, right? It's a mixed bag because on one hand you're sad because your loved one is no longer there, but on the other hand, you know their future. And you know that that's not the end of their story. And in that, you can find joy and peace. The Beatitudes of Jesus Christ describe the character of the individual who lives in God's way of life, made manifest in Jesus, right? Jesus was the perfect image of the Father. And joy, even now, though its perfection will only be realized in the kingdom of God. In contrast, people are always searching for happiness. They're not content for the happiness of the moment alone, but want a happiness that endures not only for tomorrow, but one that will comfort their memory of the past as well. But here in the Beatitudes, Jesus has given us the answer to the mystery of joy. Happiness is not an end. Why be humble in spirit? Why hunger and thirst after righteousness? 
Why be merciful and pure in heart just to be happy? Is that the reason? We're doing it just to be happy? No. We are happy as we do these things because the doing of those things brings us into a true and active fellowship with God. And that's why I say, if you're not feeling good about yourself, go do something good for someone else. Because guess what? When you do something good for someone else, you're going to feel pretty good about yourself. <laughs> it's funny how that works. You don't feel better about yourself by doing something for yourself. You feel better about yourself by doing something for someone else. And this word blessed has an interesting background in the English language. In the days of the origin of the English language, when Anglo-Saxon was in use in several related dialects, or competing for prominence as the common speech, there were more than 30 forms of the Old English word for blessed. And here's three of them. One is uh, Blodzian, uh, one is Bledzian, and one is Blessian, um, which really are meaningless to us in this day and age. But these words were based on the Old English noun blod, B-L-O-D, meaning blood. And so you can probably see where I'm going here. And, and they were altered in time to become our word blessed, or B-L-E-S-T, or blessed, B-L-E-S-S-E-D. So at this period of the history of the English language, a thing was considered blessed when it was set apart by God, or to God, by a blood ritual. And the word then referred to a consecration or sanctification. And that's you, where you get the blood part of it. And we use the, the word in this way when we speak of the prayer used before meals as a blessing. Because in our prayer, we consecrate the food and ourselves to God's service. And this is what we should be doing when we ask God's blessing on the meal. So in time, the word blessed in its early forms came to be used as a translation for the Latin word benedicere. Uh, thus, a new meaning was added to the word. Benedicere, which in its turn had been used to translate the Greek, uh, the Greek word eulogene, meant to speak well of something or someone, or to eulogize. It was always used in the Latin Bible for the eulogizing or praising of God. And when people sing God's praises, they bless him. Thus, the word is used in this second sense in verses like Luke 168, where it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. And we have several hymns that uh, have that use in it. The third meaning of blessed arose from the fact that the words blessed, and which is bless, blessed and blessed, were alike in spelling and pronunciation to another ancient English word, the word bliss and therefore came in time to assimilate into its meaning also. So we know this because eventually writers began to spell the words blessed um, with an I or with a Y instead of with an E. And the word blessed or blessed or blissed uh, was the result. Blissed meant happy or joyful. So at this stage of its development, bless, blessed meant either consecration, praise, or happiness, and blissed became a term for spiritual joy. And it's easy to get confused going through all of that, but it's, it's, etymology is interesting when you look at how words evolve. 
So somebody is blissful used to mean that you had a spiritual joy. When this happened, a new word was called in to express non-religious joy, the word blith, B-L-I-T-H-E. And so in 1746 AD, we find a poet writing to a former friend, and he says, I trust that we shall meet on blithier days. So it's this third use of the word blessed that occurs in the Sermon on the Mount. So when Jesus spoke these words, he was telling his listeners how they could be deeply spiritual and profoundly happy or joyful, and how they could maintain this happiness even in the midst of life's disappointments and hard times. You see, we must realize that by its own definition, Jesus was himself supremely happy and beyond joyous, even though he was struck with severe trial. He had serenity, confidence, contentment, peace, and joy. He probably laughed at appropriate times in a proper way, and he didn't, you know, pleasure seek or act silly or roast others like, you know, some of us would do. His happiness was not dependent on outward circumstances. He didn't crave an outward stimulus to make him happy like the world does with drugs or alcohol or whatever else. He had learned a secret that allowed him to live above the circumstances of life and above the fear of the future. He reacted with calmness, certainty, and serenity through the most trying circumstances, including torture and his own death. The Beatitudes are a portrait of Christ who was poor in spirit, but who possessed the kingdom of heaven. You know, Paul describes him as humble in Philippians 2, 8 through 10, where it says, in being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross or stake. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So Christ was one who mourned and yet was comforted. And the 22nd Psalm describes it. The subheading on that chapter uh, in the Bible is the suffering, praise, and posterity of the Messiah to the chief musician set to the deer of the dawn, a Psalm of David. So let's look at that Psalm. Psalm 22, 1 through 8 says, to the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, In you our fathers trusted, and they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who seek me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in Yehovah. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. And continuing on in Psalm 22, 19 through 24, it says, But you, O Yehovah, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. 
You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear Yehovah, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. All right? This harkens back to hearing. And this really harkens to what was read in the book of Job. Right? When he said that the, uh, the afflicted, he did not um, despise or he didn't ignore them. He had mercy on the afflicted. And it's possible to find verses that identify each statement of character in the Beatitudes with Jesus to show that he is the meek one, the one who hungered, the thirst after and thirst after righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart. He was the peacemaker, and the one persecuted for righteousness sake and so on. So Jesus was rejoicing in his deep spiritual sins. Then it follows that we too can also be joyful like he was. Because the same spirit that was in him is in us. And if it is in us, it's a joyful spirit. Yes, as scripture says, there is a time to mourn, a time to laugh, but the ongoing joy is always there. See, joy doesn't mean that you're not going to have moments of sorrow or frustration, or trial. But as a way of life, there is joy. It's always there because that spirit is there. But sometimes we don't access it. But we should always be trying. And the way we do that is what we've been talking about. It's how we approach our daily life in spending time understanding more deeply the way of God. And for purposes of this message, happiness is temporary and joy is eternal. And if we're to find this happiness and joy, we must not look for it in the world's ways. The world looks for happiness through money, but there is no real happiness there. You know, money can't buy happiness. <laughs> you know how the old saying goes, but it makes misery a lot more fun, right? <laughs> but you can't, buy, you can't buy happiness. You know, a man thinks he'll be happy if he had, you know, if he can save up ten thousand dollars, and when he gets his ten thousand, he begins to think in terms of fifty thousand, and then a hundred thousand. Right? It never ends. I watched a documentary one time talking uh, to these super rich CEOs and people, and you know, they were saying it's never enough. They'll never stop trying to accumulate wealth because it's what drives them. Right? And, and that wealth is temporary. What we have is eternal. It's Aeonian. Right? Because as the affluence continues to increase, then he wishes he could become a millionaire. And after that, he starts on his second million, his third and fourth. It's never ending. And this frantic pursuit of money indicates that he is searching for something, but that the money itself has failed to provide it. Happiness doesn't come through wealth. Poverty and wealth have both failed to bring happiness. J. Paul Getty said he would give up his millions or billions for one good marriage.
It didn't matter to him because, you know, he had had several failed ones because everybody was after him for his money. In our search for happiness, we assume it resides in something that we can possess or manipulate. A spacious home or trendy clothes or powerful cars or a huge bank account. We think of expensive vacations, costly amusements, but in the end, we're just sorely mistaken. Because none of those things will bring true happiness. It might bring a temporary high, but not true happiness. Happiness doesn't depend on external things at all, but upon our inward mode of dealing with the circumstances of life. So we can be happy in this life, but how do we face things? How do we deal with things? There's no such thing as a problem, only solutions, right? That old adage. And when you look at that phrase and the mindset behind it, right? If we adopt that mindset, it will change our attitude. Because certainly that's not the case in all situations but it is a better way to look at things. It's a more positive approach, right? So every time somebody says, we have a problem, say, no, we don't. How many solutions do we have, right? Don't focus on the problem, focus on the solution. And it, it actually, I think, helps. If we have material comforts, and at the same time possess happiness, it means that our happiness stems from within ourselves. Therefore, it is temporary. Some people try to find happiness through fame, but fame doesn't guarantee happiness either. And we've all seen these Hollywood people, some of the most miserable people <laughs> are uh, in the entertainment industry. You know, and some think they can be happy with power. So they run for office, become politicians, right? And as they continue to climb that political ladder, you know, they, they, they get just more and more power hungry and that power doesn't satisfy. There's a missing link. There's something in their lives that is missing. If we are to true, you know, find true happiness and joy, we have to, we, we mustn't seek it in the same way the world does. We have to look for it in the way outlined by Jesus Christ. And according to him, the way that happiness and joy is found in a purity of spirit and a character that is marked by meekness, and in a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, in mercy, in purity, and a desire to make peace. I think that would help those of us who are on <laughs> you know, Facebook and other social media to do the last thing, to have a desire to make peace and maybe some of that friction would go away. You know, be at peace, seek peace, pursue it earnestly, is what the scripture tells us. But first we must recognize that we will never get anywhere in our search for happiness or joy until we give up trying to find it by our own efforts and receive it instead as God's free gift. This means that God is the source of all spiritual blessings, and in this, as in all things, we must look to him. And James presents this simple truth clearly in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. 
He says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God doesn't change. And certainly the first effect the Beatitudes have on those who understand them is to turn their minds to God, our Heavenly Father. Second, we must realize that the blessing of God in an, in an individual life begins with forgiveness of sins. When David wanted to speak of the joy of the believers in the Old Testament times, he wrote in Psalm 32, um, and the caption is, The Joy of Forgiveness, a Psalm of David, a Contemplation. And that's what we are to do with these scriptures, contemplate. So let's look at Psalm 32, verse, verses 1 and 2. It says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom Yehovah counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. You see, if, you're, if you have deceit in your spirit, these blessings, this happy, this joy will elude you. Also look at uh, Psalm 32, verses 10 through 11. It says, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in Yehovah. You notice how he uses these words, right? Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in Yehovah. Be glad in Yehovah and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Right? And that's quite an emphasis. Three times, glad, rejoice, shout for joy. And who is getting that? Who is able to do that all the time? The upright in heart. And Paul, years later, quoted these verses as a description of the initial joy that comes to a person who believes in Jesus Christ and repents. You see, sin is a horrible barrier that divides a person from God. But for the unbelievers, sin is somewhat like a great black umbrella that keeps him from the showers of blessing. That is the unbeliever. Oh, he can walk about under the umbrella hunting for puddles, but they will always be muddy and he will not be satisfied. And that is, in effect, the, the effect that it has on unbelievers. It's like an umbrella over them and they can never find that joy. All they can find is muddy mud puddle. Instead of this, he must ask God to remove the umbrella, as God has promised to do, because anyone who will trust in our Father in heaven, in the sacrifice made by our high priest and our master, Jesus the Christ, and his resurrection, will thereby be placed under that direct flow of joy, which comes through the Spirit from our Father in heaven. Third, we are to study the practical means by which Jesus Christ will introduce us to the life of true happiness and joy and how we are to avail ourselves of it. The life of the Sermon on the Mount is the life of Jesus, and the life of Jesus is communicated to the Christian by the Spirit of God. And the reason why no believer, no member of God's church, can find an excuse to fail to live a joyous life is because the fountain is flowing and there is plenty of water for every believer who will reach, reach out for it. 
God has the purpose and the power, but he will not overpower us with more than we can use. Love can't be commanded, and he wants us to love him. So he encourages us to do so by creating all of the qualities which go with emptiness and frustration. But when we ask him to go ahead and do his work, out comes the obstacles which keep him from filling us with that joy and that spirit. And in comes the power of the Holy Spirit so that life immediately takes on abounding quality. There is no abounding without the pressure of his power behind it. So in order for us to have abounding love, we must have God's Holy Spirit. And sometimes we push it behind us. We push it to the back part of our mind sometimes. At least that's the way it seems. And that is how we can frustrate God through this constant stiff-necked hard-headedness. Nothing can overflow from us until we have first been filled, and we cannot be filled until his power comes in with the enabling power, that enabling spirit. Recognize the fact that happiness and joy come from God and learn that the first step to God's happiness and joy is the forgiveness of sin. And we find it practically through the enabling power of God's Spirit. So finding happiness is as simple as that. People will seek for it through money, fame, power, love, and security, and in every way but that. Over in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 33, what did Christ say? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And of course, that includes joy. The righteous are called to acknowledge and praise the righteous God with gladness because of our blessings of joy and spiritual prosperity. Psalm 97 is a song of praise to Yehovah. Verse 1 says, Yehovah reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the many coastlands be glad. You see, once Christ returns and sets up God's kingdom on earth, not only will people um, not only will people, not only will spirit beings, but all of the physical creation will rejoice. And how, how does this rejoicing come about? It's going to become abundant. The flowers will be more beautiful. The lands will be plentiful. The animals will have a changed nature and on and on. Right? It's going to be transformed into a thing of beauty. Tears will be wiped away. No more sadness will be found. Continuing in Psalm 97, verses 2 through 12. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before Yehovah, before the Lord or master of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the peoples see his glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you Elohim. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Yehovah. For you, O Yehovah, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted above all gods. O you who love Yehovah, hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them 
from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in Yehovah, O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. God's people are called saints, the righteous, the upright in heart, and all of these names speak of a life devoted to God. We should love him, obey him, and we can obey him uh, by hating evil. That's part of obedience. And rejoice in him and give thanks to him for all his mercies. After all, he protects his people. He delivers them, gives them light for their path, and puts gladness in their hearts, our hearts. He protects his people entirely. The image in verse 11 is that of a sower. The Lord plants light like seeds so that his people will not always walk in darkness. And what he plants will eventually bear fruit. Sowing in, is a frequent metaphor in scripture for the deeds of both God and, the, and people. And this psalm begins with a universal revelation of God's glory in verses 2 through 6 with dramatic flashes of lightning. But it ends with his light quietly shining on the path of his people. And some see the image as that of the dawn with the morning light diffused along the ground as though the Lord were planting it like a a seed in front of it as we go. So, our Father in Heaven always shows joy with that light that He puts in our path. Because when we walk in the light, we also have joy in our Creator. And Yehovah's people have their dark days when life is difficult. There's no doubt. But there are always seeds of light and joy to accompany us along the way. And God is always with us. Turn over in conclusion to Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. It says, I have set Yehovah always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul in Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So, is there any reason at all for any of us not to be joyful? I mean, we're, we're a little bit out of our element, but who cares what goes wrong in one sense? God is there to make it right. So, don't let the world dampen your joy. Don't let it steal your happiness. We can be confident in God's promises. And as long as we're right with our Father in heaven, there is nothing and no reason we cannot be joyful.